out of the King James Version. You can follow along with me beginning at Leviticus 23, verse 9. Because I'm going to be getting into some technical aspects of the Scriptures, I would like to use a translation that's more literal than dynamic or paraphrase. Let's read Leviticus chapter 23, verses 9 through 16. Then we'll have a word of prayer and we'll get into our Father's word. Leviticus 23, beginning at verse 9. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheaf an he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto Yahweh. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto Yahweh for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of an hen. And you shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, shall you number fifty days, and you shall offer a new meat offering unto Yahweh. I'd like to talk a little bit today about the Feast of Pentecost, begin to talk a little bit about the Feast of Pentecost today. Sometimes we tend to kind of put this feast on the back burner because it's not as lengthy. It's not as many days as the other two commanded feasts in Scripture. We've already kept one this year, Passover slash Feast of Unleavened Bread. That one lasts about seven days. And then in the fall, we keep the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Shelters, some Bibles say, and that one lasts for about seven days. They're the longest of the three commanded festivals, but there's one that's right in the middle of the two. And it's got two names to the feast. The name that I've already called it is... Pentecost. Uh, the word Pentecost stems from the Greek word pente, which means five, and Pentecost literally means in Greek 50. That stems from the Greek language. Okay? But there's another name for the feast called the Feast of Weeks. In Hebrew, it's called Shavuot, which literally just means weeks. The Hebrew name centers in on one aspect of the count to the feast specifically the weeks that are counted. And the other name centers in on the second aspect of the count to the feast with the number 50. No matter how you count for the Feast of Pentecost, whether you believe that Pentecost takes place in the third month or if you believe that Pentecost takes place in the fourth month, you still have two aspects to the count. Seven weeks, which is about how many days... 49 days, right? And then you have an additional count, whether you count one day after the 49 as the 50th day, or whether you count 50 additional days to the 49. There's still two aspects to the count, and I think that's why there's two names to the feast. We have a Hebrew name, Shavuot, weeks, a Greek name, Pentecost, 50. Two different aspects to the count, two different names for the feast. As with many of Yahweh's feast days, there is a controversy when it comes to this feast. You say, Brother Matthew, there's a controversy about everything. Yes, there is. And you know what? Ignorance is definitely bliss. When you don't know about any of this, 
You just live in a blissful life. Nobody ever tells you there's a controversy. You show up to the congregation and you're all geared up. You've learned about the feast days. You've learned about the sacred name. You've learned about the Torah. And then you begin to learn about all the controversies. You begin to learn that there's 62 different ways to count to the feast, right? I'm being facetious when I say that. You begin to learn that there's many different variations of how people pronounce the sacred name or many ways that people keep the Sabbath. And all these things are very controversial. And we can allow those controversies to be extremely argumentative and hateful. Or we can allow those controversies to be genuine, honest, serious, encouraging, and even enlightening to our brains because as the proverb says, iron sharpens iron. You know, uh, Matthew Henry talked about how that, that passage referred to people getting together that were intelligent about the scriptures and bouncing their ideas off of one another. Matthew Henry was a Puritan commentator on the Bible in the 1600s. And I think that that's a good thing because when you have two or more people come together and you discuss, different ideas get thrown out. Different ideas get brought up. And you churn and you churn and you churn that milk until finally the froth or the cream comes to the top where you can make the good stuff, right, Sister Myers? So there is a controversy about how to count to the Feast of Pentecost. And what I want to talk about today is the first aspect of the count. We'll get more into this throughout the weeks in this particular moon. A couple of things that I want to mention about the Feast of Pentecost, just to begin with as a briefing. Verse 10, he says, Speaking to the children of Israel and saying to them, When ye be coming to the land which I give unto you and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. So this is talking to the children of Israel. Leviticus 23, the time setting is they're in the wilderness. They're wandering around in the wilderness, okay? Somewhere within the 40-year time frame. This is probably, if my mind serves me right, in the second year of their wilderness wanderings based upon the last passage of Exodus and moving into Leviticus where the thought continues. So this is about the second year of their wilderness wanderings. And he's telling them, look, when you enter into the land that I'm going to give you, we know that's talking about Canaan land, the land where the tribes got their allotment. Some tribes got their allotment on this side of the Jordan, right? Most of the tribes got their allotment on the other side of the Jordan. And we know that the Israelites, based upon Joshua chapter 5, verses 10 through 14, Joshua 5, 10 through 14 tells us that the Israelites entered into the land of Canaan in the First month, the first month on the calendar. One of the ways we know that is because right after they entered into the land, they kept the Passover and obviously the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And they were commanded right here in Leviticus 23 and 10 to do what? When you enter into the land, you shall reap the harvest thereof. Now, the harvest that took place in the first month or in the springtime was the harvest of, of barley. This is critical to knowing when to begin the count to the Feast of Weeks or to Pentecost. So you come into the land, Israelites, you reap the harvest. Obviously, that means you reap a harvest that's already there, barley that somebody has planted previously in the fall. And so they're going to reap that harvest thereof. And then it says, you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. Whenever the Israelites harvested, the first fruits were not to be eaten by them. They were to be given to the Almighty. Why? Was the Almighty hungry? No. It was a recognition of His blessing. Because He's blessed you with a harvest, you give Him the first and the best of that harvest. Okay? So they were to bring the first fruits, the first cut of that barley to the priest. Obviously, it was a Levite priest. And then in verse 11, it says, And he shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Yahweh was very particular about the day that he was to wave that sheaf, or as the Greek Septuagint says, which we'll get into here in a little bit, he was to lift up that sheaf. Now, I think that there's spiritual significance to this because our Savior in 1 Corinthians 15 is called the first fruits of those that have fallen asleep. And I believe that he was lifted up and waved before the Father. 
on the same day that this first fruits was lifted up. And I've taught a sermon on that before. So there's spiritual significance to all of these feast days. All of these feast days are a shadow of a reality. They were a shadow every year when that first fruits of barley was brought to the priest and he lifted that sheaf up. It was a shadow of something that was greater. They've always been a shadow and they're still shadows. Some of the feast days, the reality has already came about. Some of them, though, the reality will yet to become a, come about in the future. Okay? So, we, we read this and we think, okay, this is fairly easy to understand. We go into the land. We cut the barley. We bring the barley to a, a Levite priest. He lifts it up. He waves it before the Father, and he waves it on the morrow after the Sabbath. That's easy. Ignorance is bliss, right? But we have to ask ourselves, what Sabbath is he talking about? If he says the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it, is it just any Sabbath? Do we just get to pick? One fellow asked me one time that was working out here at the congregation. Didn't talk too much, but I was out here working in the yard, and he stopped me, and he said, Matthew, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, the way that y'all keep y'all's no work days, y'all Sabbath days, how do y'all do it? He said, do y'all just pick and choose them as you go? And I said, no, I don't, we don't do that. I said, they're based upon the heavenly calendar, right? They're based upon something that's taking place in the heavens. A lot of times when people first hear about the heavenly calendar, they put their hands on their head and they do like this, and they say, that's very confusing. What's happening, though, is they're coming out of confusion, see? Okay? It's only odd because it's different, and it's something that's fresh or new to that individual person. Once you begin to get a grasp of Genesis and the heavens and the sun, the moon and the stars. And the more you study about them, you understand these are Yahweh's timepieces in the heavens. We tell time by these things. Everybody used to tell time by the heavens. Even the clock is only about 100, 150 years old. Okay, And a clock is actually based, even the way that it is, it's based upon a sundial or the telling time by the, by the sun. The morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave the sheaf. The morrow after what Sabbath? Do we just pick the Sabbath? Do I just come up to Brother Tim and I say, you know what, Brother Tim? This Sabbath, it feels right. I'm checking the wind. Yeah, everything's... You know, so let's pick this Sabbath. Let's take it to the, to the priest. No, you can't just pick the Sabbath. There's a particular Sabbath that is in view here. So what I want to do, and everybody here in the congregation... So I just want to interject something right here because this is a really interesting point on what Sabbath are we talking about? Because... Um, if you're on a fixed day, meaning that your Sabbath is Saturday, this this creates a conundrum. <laughs> it really does. Because you're waiting a whole week to the Sabbath to start your count. As for the lunar solar, and as Matthew Jensen just eloquently pointed out, the Sabbath during feast time, it's going to be a high Sabbath because every 8, 15, 22, and 29 day of the month is a Sabbath. So when you've got a feast day that falls on the 15th, guess what you got? It's called a high Sabbath. And it happens every time, every year for these feasts. It's not something that happens every seven years, which what happens on the fixed day calendar. We're talking about the 15th day. And the morrow after the Sabbath would be what? The 16th day. So this, my brother in Arizona, is how you get a difference in the count and observance. So you first of all have to be on the lunar solar calendar to have the correct count and the correct Sabbath that we're talking about in the first place. So... Um, I really appreciate Matthew Jensen's presentation on this and, and pointing this out. And I concur with it 100%. This is accurate 100%. Congregation will be able to watch as I write on the board. So if you're listening by way of phone, you might want to take a piece of paper and a pencil and begin with the number 14 and go all the way through the number 21. And I'm going to run out of room here. I'll write 20.
Okay, you guys, this is a beep time. This is a time at Passover. Okay, so Passover is around this area right here. And then we got unleavened bread for seven days, concluding on what? The 22nd day, which is a Sabbath. So we go from Sabbath to Sabbath. See how they conveniently fence in there? It's just like you would design that. You don't get this with the seventh day, uh, excuse me, the um, fixed day observance. Okay, so we're talking about a beeb time when they're looking for the beeb of the barley, the ripe, that word means ripening in Hebrew. They're looking for the ripening of the barley, which means the, feeds, the fields are green. Okay, they're not brown. They're green. They're looking for the ripening. And here's where we start our count, right here. So if the 15th day is the high Sabbath, and tomorrow after the Sabbath would be right here. 21 down here. And then at the top, you can write, this is the month of Abib. Uh, the Babylonian name for that month is Nisan, mentioned twice in Scripture. Abib means ears of grain, referring to the barley ears. The reason that I write 14 through 21 here is because the 14th day of Abib, anybody know what that is? Passover. That's Passover. We're going to put a P for Passover. When I say that's Passover, what I mean is that's the day that the Passover lamb is slaughtered. Okay? Now, beginning here on the 15th day, we have the first day of unleavened bread. First day, second day, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. You guys, every year... The first day of unleavened bread is a Shabbat. It's a high Shabbat because the feast falls on a Shabbat day, the 15th. It happens again at Sukkot time. You got high Shabbats. High Shabbats every year on Yahuwah's calendar. Not every seven years, right? The day after the Shabbat, the morrow after the Shabbat, seven Sabbaths complete ends like this. And then you count your 50 days. But for, for this, Abib, this is when we start in our count, the day after the high Sabbath, which is right here. Seventh day, and then let's put the 22nd right here. Beginning at this dot and ending at this dot is the seven-day feast of unleavened bread. You can read this in Exodus chapter 12. You can read it in the early portion of Leviticus 23, 1 through 8, how that there are Seven days of unleavened bread, just like there are seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles where you dwell in temporary shelters. The command about waving the sheaf of the first fruits comes directly after the instructions about Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So it's always been understood that the Sabbath in Leviticus 23 verse 11 that the priest is to lift the sheaf up on, has something to do with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The instructions are dovetailed. They come one right after the other. There is four different ways that I know of, probably I could dwindle it down to three, to interpret Leviticus 23, verse 11. What Sabbath is it talking about? Some people say that keep Saturday as the Sabbath. People keep Saturday as the Sabbath, and they say, when it says the morrow after the Sabbath, it's talking about not the weekly Saturday Sabbath that they believe is the true Sabbath, but it's talking about the first day of unleavened bread, which the scriptures call a no work day. To most people, the first day of unleavened bread is an annual Sabbath in addition to the weekly Saturday Sabbath. So people say that we need to bring the sheaf to the priest on the morrow after the Sabbath, which will be the 16th day of Abib. That's the time that the priest needs to wave the sheaf. Another group that still keeps Saturday Sabbath says, no, we can't do that because the Hebrew word in Leviticus 23.11 is Shabbat. It's Shabbat, and it refers to the weekly Sabbath. And since we believe that Saturday is the weekly Sabbath, this is what these people say, we need to recognize that we can't wave the sheaf on the morrow after just the annual Sabbath, but we've got to wave the sheaf on the morrow after the weekly Shabbat, the morrow after the Shabbat. So what they say is we need to find the Saturday that hits in here 
And whatever Saturday hits in here, we'll wave the sheaf on the day after that. And that can fluctuate throughout the year. If you look on a calendar, because Saturday is determined, I believe, by the Gregorian calendar, Saturday can hit on any day from the 14th through the 21st. So, for instance, let's say that Saturday hits on the 18th. That means this group would wave the sheaf on the 19th, or at least believe the sheaf was to be waved on the 19th. Now, the following year, Saturday might hit on the 16th. That means they would wave the sheaf on the 17th. The Sunday that falls after the Saturday within the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's the second way that people believe it. There's the third way. Not a lot of people know about this, and not many people do it like this. But there's a third way that some people say that when it says the morrow after the Sabbath, it's talking about the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I know one fellow that does it like this. And some people believe that there was an ancient group called the, I believe it's pronounced the Bothusians, uh, could have been part of the Sadducees that observed it like this. I don't think that that's the case. But this, I'm explaining their argument. So they would start counting, or excuse me, they would bring the sheaf on the 22nd. That's three different ways. Brother Matthew, how do you believe it? Well, I believe totally different from all three of them, right? As I normally do, right? Somebody says, you always believe something different. I don't believe something different because I just want to be different. I believe something different because I believe the Scriptures teach a little something different. Now, my view does mimic one of the views that I've already mentioned. I do believe that every year, without exception, that the sheaf of Leviticus 23 and 11 is to be waved on the 16th day of Abib. I believe that the Sabbath that's being talked about is the 15th day of Abib. And so therefore, every year without exception, the 16th day of Abib is the day of the first fruit wave sheaf offering. One of the reasons I believe that is because of the way that I believe the Sabbaths are to be reckoned, which is obviously by the lunar cycle. Because I believe the Sabbaths are based upon the moon cycle, that means for me, the 15th day of Abib is not just an annual Sabbath. It's not just a, a Sabbath in addition to the weekly Saturday Sabbath, quote unquote. The 15th is the weekly Sabbath. Because we started on Abib 1 with a new moon, which is not a work day. Then after that new moon, we counted seven days, bringing us to our first Shabbat or our first Sabbath on the eighth day of Abib. That means our second count of seven will bring us to the 15th of Abib, which is always a weekly Sabbath. Now, the scriptures call it a high day in John 19, 31. Uh, that word high, remember when they were going to get the bodies off of the torture state? So they were in a hurry to get the bodies of the criminals and also the Messiah off of the torture stakes because the Sabbath was drawing near. And then the text says, for that Sabbath day was a high day. Uh, that word high in the Greek is megas. It's where we get the word mega. It means big. Uh, the reason I believe it was a high day or a big day is because it was one day, but it wasn't just the weekly Sabbath. It was also the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So it made it a little more special. The next moon, the second moon, when the 15th rolled around, I believe that would be a weekly Sabbath too. But it wouldn't be a high day because there was no feast involved. You see that? Every year, this is not just an annual Sabbath. It's not just the first day of the feast. It's also a weekly seventh day Sabbath. Well, that sounds really good, Brother Matthew, but how do you know that that's the Sabbath? How do you know that's the Sabbath that Leviticus 23 and 11 is talking about where it says, on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Sounds to me like you're kind of just grasping for straws, like you're kind of just making things up still. This is one of the reasons that I believe it's talking about the 15th. What I've got right here is the Greek Septuagint. And I reference this often. And the reason I reference it often is because I should. It's very important. This was probably the Bible of many of the Christians that we read about in the book of Acts and also the epistles of the New Testament. Most of the time, when authors of the New Testament quote from the Old Testament, their quotation lines up directly with the Septuagint. 
Sometimes their quotations line up with the Hebrew text of Scripture, and sometimes their quotations don't line up perfectly with either text, but it's just getting the meaning across. Okay? The Greek Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament Scriptures. The Torah portion, Genesis through Deuteronomy, and by the way, that's where we get the names, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those are not Hebrew names. Those are Greek names. They stem from the Septuagint. If we were Hebrew-speaking people, we would call Deuteronomy Devarim. We would call Numbers Bamidvar. We call them Genesis through Deuteronomy because it stems from the Greek language, not the Hebrew. The Greek Septuagint is very significant. It began to be translated approximately 300 years before the time of the Messiah. So when the Messiah came on the scene, the Greek Septuagint was in full activity. Many Judahite people that lived in the land of Egypt, whose common language was Greek, used the Septuagint. Tradition says that there were about 70 Judahite or Israelite men that could speak both Hebrew and Greek that did the translation. 70, some people say 72. That's why it's called the Septuagint, meaning 70, sometimes abbreviated with the Roman numerals LXX, which stand for the number 70. Let's say 250 to 300 years before the time of the Messiah, this translation was done. How does Leviticus 23, verse 11, read in the Greek Septuagint? Let me read it. Leviticus 23, verse 11 says this, And he shall lift up the sheath before Yahweh to be accepted for you. Let's stop right there for a second. Pretty much the same. A little bit of a difference. The Hebrew text translated into English says, He shall wave the sheaf. The Septuagint says, He shall lift it up. Obviously, that makes sense. You lift it up, wave it. No contradiction, no problem there. All right? But the next part of verse 11 says this, On the morrow of the first day, the priest shall lift it up. That's a variation. We read the KJV, which is based upon the Hebrew text, and it says the Sheaf is to be lifted up on the morrow after the Sabbath. The Septuagint says it's to be lifted up on the morrow of the first day. What is that talking about? Well, look at Leviticus 23, verse 4. Leviticus 23, verse 4 says this, These are the feasts of Yahweh, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. In the fourteenth day of the first month, at even, or between the evenings, literally, is Yahweh's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto Yahweh. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Verse 7 is my key. We'll stop here at verse 7. In the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. If we back up from Leviticus 23.11 to find the first mention of a first day prior to verse 11, we find that in verse 7. And the first day in verse 7 is talking about the first day of the feast of unleavened bread. So when the Septuagint says on the morrow of the first day you wave or lift up the sheaf, that's the 16th. That's not contrary to to the Hebrew text that says on the morrow after the Sabbath. Why? Because that is the Sabbath. It's the Sabbath. It's the seventh day Sabbath, according to the lunar cycle as we believe. It's an annual Sabbath, according to the feast. But it's also the first day of something different. It's the first day of what? The Feast of Unleavened Bread. So there's no contradiction between the Greek Septuagint and the Hebrew Masoretic text. No contradiction. The Hebrew-speaking Israelites would believe exactly like the Greek-speaking Israelites. The Septuagint translators were not trying to distort the Hebrew text when they translated Sabbath as first day. Why weren't they? Because it meant the same thing. It's saying the same thing in two different ways. The Septuagint is an extremely strong indicator that this is how the wave sheaf was calculated anciently. This is the Sabbath being talked about. Interestingly enough, part of the controversy or the debate that exists amongst feast keepers 
they constantly debate about, is it the annual Sabbath or is it the weekly Sabbath? Is it the annual Sabbath or is it the weekly Sabbath? Is it the 15th or is it the 18th that I put right here on the board? If they understood that the Sabbaths were by the lunar cycle, the argument would vanish. Because the annual Sabbath and the weekly Sabbath is on the same day. They harmonize. Any other way, the Greek Septuagint and the Hebrew Masoretic text are contradicting one another. When lunar Sabbaths, Sabbaths by the lunar cycle, the great light, lesser than the sun, but still great, the great light that Yahweh put in the heavens, the moon, with lunar Sabbaths, everything comes and dovetails together. You don't have to throw out the Septuagint. You don't have to throw out the Masoretic text. I've been in roundtable discussions before where people will say, but it says right here in the Septuagint, tomorrow after the first day, the first day of the feast, it's got to be the 16th when you lift up the sheaf. And then the other group says, but it says right here in the Hebrew, tomorrow after the Sabbath, the Shabbat, it's got to be Saturday Sabbath. And this group does away with the Septuagint, and this group does away with the Hebrew text. And I'm sitting there and I'm scratching my, my beard, part of it. And I'm saying, brothers, if you could only understand the lunar cycle, then they would come together. There would be no more contradiction. Interestingly enough, there was no apparent contradiction in Scripture before the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. This only came about after the destruction of the temple, and I believe after the Sabbath was changed to fit the Gregorian or at least the Julian cycle in that day. So, is there any other evidence? This is as far as I'm going to get today. Is there any other evidence that the Sabbath being talked about was the 15th. There is. I've got a couple of books I'd like to read out of real quickly. Uh, the first one I'd like to read is the works of Philo. Philo lists a lot of information about the feast days in his work. He was a Levite, Israelite, that lived in Alexandria, Egypt, very prominent Israelite in his area, part of the Levitical tribe. He was born in 20 B.C., and he lived until 30 A.D. So his life started before Yeshua was born. His life spanned the life of Messiah, and his life ended towards the end of Yeshua's ministry. And when Philo, in his works, records the feast days, he tells you how things were taking place with his people. Very interesting to read. I just want to read one portion out of Philo, the Special Laws, Part 2 of the Special Laws, parentheses 162. And anybody's welcome to come up here and, and look at this if you'd like after the sermon. He says this, Special Laws 2, parentheses 162, chapter 29. But within the feast, there is another feast following directly after the first day. Now, you have to read up above it because he's just got finished talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And he says, within that feast, Unleavened Bread, there's another one. And it follows directly after the what, does Philo say? The first day. First day of the feast, just like the Septuagint. That makes sense. Philo's Bible would have been the Greek Septuagint. That's what Torah he would have read. So Philo believed that the wave sheaf was always offered on the 16th. But not only did Philo believe that, that's how his Israelite brothers did it. Then we have the Judahite historian, Josephus. His lifetime spanned from 37 A.D. to 100 A.D. He was born in 37 A.D. after Yeshua had already went to heaven. And he lived till after the destruction of the temple. He actually records what took place at the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. here in his work. He also writes about this particular wave sheaf. He says this in the Antiquities of the Judahites, chapter 10, parentheses 250. He says this, But on the second day of unleavened bread, which is the 16th day of the month, they first eat of the fruits of the earth, for before that day they do not touch them. Why would the Israelites first eat of the fruits of the earth? Talking about the harvest, the new harvest. On the 16th, it's because the first fruits would have already been weighed. Remember we read in our opening text how that you were not supposed to eat of it until you bring. And look what he's citing here, what 
Josephus is saying the first fruits of the barley. It's mm -hmm. barley. Yahweh the first, then you can eat. And Josephus is even more specific than Philo in that he says it's the second day of unleavened bread. This is the first day of unleavened bread. This is the second day of unleavened bread, the 16th. And he calls it the So what that means, you guys, is at Passover time, when the, the priests are waving first fruits of the barley, it's the beginning of the barley harvest, which means by the time that we get to Shavuot, it's the end of barley harvest. You, so you'll see fields of brown barley everywhere being harvested, like I just showed you in the last video. That was not wheat. It was, in fact, barley, because when we get to Shavuot, we're coming into the beginning of the wheat harvest. And then when we get to um, Sukkot, it's the end. It's all concluded, and we're celebrating the whole year. So it's preposterous. It is just laughable that anybody would imply that wheat is concluded. Wheat is concluded now. At the end of May in Israel, it's ridiculous. Thank you. Because it's the it's the end of the barley harvest going into the beginning of the wheat harvest. I hope this is making sense to you, to you guys. The 16th. And he says, this is when we start to eat of the produce. Why? The first fruits have been offered up. This is very important. This is just one aspect. We'll get into further aspects of the count next week. This is the first aspect of the count to Pentecost or Shavuot. First aspect, you have to know how to begin to count before you can know how to end the count, right? Hopefully we've learned a little bit today. And if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to ask me uh, after we dismiss here. And if you want to look at these books, you can do Thank you so much to Matthew Jensen on this presentation. And he just laid it out for you, pre precise information. And I really appreciate the due diligence and the observation from this brother. I don't know him personally, but I do concur with what his conclusion is. So here is another witness, you guys, and and someone who understands the, the lunar sound. If you are not on the lunar solar calendar, you're on a fixed Saturday calendar, you're not going to get this. And you're going to try to, to fit a round peg into a square hole and try to force it. And that's what they do with the way that they reckon the new year. Because when I go back on Remnant House on their previous feast days, Passover to Passover, Shavuot to Shavuot, you know what I find? I find extra days. Why is there extra days between Passover to Passover? It should be a complete year and not more than a complete year, correct? Well, if you go and in, 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 in understand what it is being said in Jubilees about incorrectly observing the moon, you'll end up with 10 days every year. It accumulates because you, you ignore the new moon. Go and look at what I'm telling you, guys. It's the absolute truth. And here's another witness to it. Shalom to you. May you will bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you.